You can pray until you faint. But if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, Honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Black Power Talks. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter Mlemwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24-7. Today on Black Power Talks, we're going to learn about the colonial origins of Santa Claus, also known as Santa Claus, or Saint Nick, the patron saint of shipping. Colonial ideology purports the Christmas holiday to be a celebration of the birth of Jesus. In fact, the Christmas holiday is centered around the obsessive pursuit and aspiration to purchase gifts. This colonial tradition of gift buying is linked to the mythology of Santa Claus. The holiday season facilitates a disproportionate transfer of wealth from the African working class to the white ruling class. Two months of sales and even market trends, such as the release of special video games and consoles, deals on electronics and mobile phones, and special sneaker releases are used to lure the African working class into this frenzy of shopping and gift buying. The ACNM Group, a self-described multicultural and sports marketing agency, finds that Africans spend more money in the U.S. during the holiday season than any other time of the year. CNBC notes that the average U.S. spending increases by 10.7%, in the holiday season. Yet, ACNM finds that African spending will increase by 15%. Even while the world marks two years of the coronavirus pandemic and the Omicron variant multiplies 70 times faster than the highly contagious Delta variant, CNBC has reported that 2021 will be a record year in holiday sales. Shoppers in the U.S. will spend nearly $900 million this season. Other reports have noted that holiday spending has risen at the fastest rate in 17 years. Holidays serve the purpose of forging a national identity through shared observations of religious or patriotic events. Christmas is not different. Much like Thanksgiving, Christmas in fact became a national holiday in the settler colonial nation-building period of the late 19th century. Christmas, therefore, became a shared tradition during a period known as redemption, a period of white nationalist reunification. This redemption was supported by the increased theft of indigenous land and the theft of African labor and resources. During this period, indigenous people were slaughtered by the U.S. military and herded on concentration camps called reservations. As well, The stolen labor of Africans built railroads, dammed rivers, mined that stolen land, and slaved as sharecroppers. In the Pacific, Asia, the Caribbean, Central America, and South America, as well as Africa, the colonial capitalist assault against African and other colonized people escalated. It is this assault that has produced the material basis for Christmas. In 1930, the African poet Langston Hughes identified these colonial capitalist contradictions in the following poem entitled, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, China, from the gunboats in the river. 
10 inch shells for Christmas gifts and peace on earth forever. Merry Christmas, India, to Gandhi and his cell. From righteous Christian England, ring out bright Christmas bell. Ring Merry Christmas, Africa, from Cairo to the Cape. Ring hallelujah, praise the Lord for murder and rape. Ring Merry Christmas, Haiti, and drown the voodoo drums. We'll rob you to the Christian hymns until the next Christ comes. Ring Merry Christmas, Cuba, while Yankee domination keeps a nice fat president in a little half-starved nation. Until you down and out us, due to economic laws, oh, eat, drink, and be merry with a breadline Santa Claus. While all around the world hails Christmas, while all the church bells sway, while better still the Christian guns proclaim this joyous day, while holy steel that makes us strong spits forth a mighty Yuletide song, shoot, Merry Christmas everywhere. Let Merry Christmas gas the air. The Santa Claus myth represents these colonial capitalist contradictions. A fat white man from an uninhabitable, cold, and barren place in the North distributes gifts to boys and girls. The Santa Claus myth has its origins in a Dutch tradition surrounding the characters Santa Claus and Zwarte Piet, Black Piet in English. These traditions are celebrated in the Netherlands, also known as Holland, the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium, and throughout the colonial Dutch world. According to the tradition, Santa Claus arrives on a ship from Spain and enters the city on a white horse while being surrounded by hundreds of black servants. That's Zwarte Piet. Zwarte Piet delivers candy, spices, and other colonial items to good children. Meanwhile, Zwarte Piet stuffs the bad children into his bag and takes them back to Spain. This tradition is celebrated throughout the Dutch-speaking world with annual festivals and parades. In these parades, hundreds of white people dress up in blackface, paint their lips red, and put on fake locks and Afro wigs as they parade through town. For decades, African activists in the Dutch-speaking world, and even to some extent the German-speaking world, have organized a serious pushback against these festivals. Yet, despite this anti-colonial pushback, the Santa Claus festivals persist. The persistence of these blackface Santa Claus festivals underscores the role Christmas more generally and the Santa Claus Festival specifically plays in shaping white national consciousness. The entrenched embrace and defense of Santa Claus and Swartz Pete reflects the loss of white identity as the crisis of imperialism deepens. To better understand the roots and significance of the struggle and this cultural phenomenon of Santa Claus and Zwarte Pete, we're going to share with you, our listeners, an excerpt from a conversation between Chairman Amalia Chatella and Peggy Burke of the Global African Congress, speaking directly from Amsterdam, that took place on November 28, 2004. I was recently in Holland. In fact, I was in Amsterdam and uh, had an opportunity to experience a, a Christmas parade. And the difference in Santa Claus there and Santa Claus here is that while in the U.S., the, the myth is that uh, Santa Claus brings bad children uh, coal, stick coal in their stockings instead of gifts, and the, and the bad children do not get gifts. In Holland, Santa Claus uh, travels with a servant whose name is Sparta Pete or Black Pete. And Black Pete is the guy who, if the children are bad, he sticks them in, in sacks and takes them off uh, screaming and fighting and kicking to Spain. And I happened to be, uh, as I said, in, in uh, Amsterdam a few days ago where the Santa parade happened and uh, was, it was incredible. It was uh, more than, than uh, most Africans here could even imagine. But there's this, this situation where you have all these uh, white people who have blackface. They wear blackface. They, they're like minstrels, like Al Jolson. And they are portraying uh, Swartha Peak. And they wear clothes that are, are similar to what uh, Moors might have uh, worn uh, who occupied uh, Spain up until uh, the 15th century. 
and sometimes dancing and prancing in the streets, and sometimes they even wore fake uh, dreadlocks. It, it was incredible uh, to be an African standing there watching these minstrels, these white people in blackface, uh, marching down. And then, of course, uh, you had this uh, white man riding on a big white horse with a big cross on a, a hat that looked something like the, what the Pope might wear. And uh, he was the beneficent Santa Claus. And uh, Blackfeet Swatapeak was his servant. And so uh, I got into a sort of impromptu uh, debate with this woman who is called the, the mayor of Central Amsterdam, who was trying to explain to me why it was all right for these white people uh, to be wearing this black face and why there was nothing wrong but it just as someone coming from the outside, uh, I, would, I might mistakenly uh, think that there was something bad about it. But the truth of the matter is that in Holland, uh, African people also, uh, many of them, find something terribly wrong uh, with this Santa Claus uh, Swata Peak combination. And a campaign has uh, emerged where the Africans are, are struggling with the, the government of the Netherlands to do away with uh, Swata Peak. And I have on the, on the line with me from Amsterdam, Peggy Burke, who is uh, also a come to be a dear friend who I met a few days ago in Holland, and I would like for her to join us in this discussion because the truth is that when we live uh, these isolated lives as African people in America or in other places, we come to uh, think that our experiences are Af as Africans are peculiar to us. We don't understand that there's a universal oppression and ridicule for African people that has uh, that have come as a consequence of our being a captive people, our land and resources stolen from us. So um, we're going to ask uh, Peggy to join us and and to talk to us uh, about the campaign, about Swatter Pete himself and how that's experienced by African people there and what we need to be doing uh, collectively to get rid of Swatter Pete and some of the other uh, oppression uh, that we'll face. Uh, Peggy, Sister Peggy, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Somali. I was, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've, uh, in presentations that I've done for years now, I've talked about Sparta Pete and, uh, Santa Claus in explaining, um, the, the whole history of this phenomenon with, uh, Santa Claus here in this country. But I was shocked to actually to see this phenomenon when I was in Amsterdam. And, and, uh, uh, the first thing I saw earlier that day, bef uh, at the, uh, at the train station, because I came to Amsterdam from Eindhoven, Oven, and uh, was a child uh, in in one of the stores in the in the in the station who had on some kind of costume and and uh, a, a little what looked like soot on her face and I I thought uh, perhaps it has something to do with uh, Halloween uh, or some kind of Halloween thing and didn't pay that much attention to it until I got to this parade that was shocking I also noticed that there were Africans who came out with their families and chil their children to enjoy uh, uh, Santa Claus and Spot to Pete. So uh, how is this thing being experienced? Uh, uh... Well, you see, uh, people think about it uh, very differently. And uh, as, as, as you know, uh, probably um, uh, more, more than a lot of other people, is that um, one of the great things that um, colonization has done after slavery is that it taught black people that they are um, worth less than white people. So they started to believe it. And what happened is that they imposed this feast upon us. And even in countries like Suriname, where I come from, which used to be a, a, a Dutch colony, and in the Dutch Antilles, we were forced to celebrate this feast. And uh, like many other things where um, white supremacy is, is, is up, uh, uh, how do you call it, is, is posed upon us, this feast was accepted by black people. But when black people move from their country and uh, they go to the country of the colonizer, they start to realize that everything they've learned in their country about the, the supremacy it doesn't work because you have white people um, fixing the streets. You have uh, white people begging for money. So you see that, listen, all these things you've been teaching us, they're not true. So what happened is that there's a large movement here 
who says, we are no longer accepting this, this feast. But of course, there are still black people amongst us who don't see the harm of this caricature called Swap the Piet. And they just celebrate the feast with the Dutch like uh, nothing has happened. So all we could have done uh, in the last couple of years was make our people aware by uh, doing radio programs, by writing articles in the newspaper about the wrongness of this feast. Well, we still don't have the whole group behind us, but I think we um, find more and more people uh, learning to accept that this feast is against black people. It, it really puts black people down. I mean, if, if you listen to the songs that they're singing also uh, during this feast, uh, one, one sentence in a, in a song is, even though I'm black as the night, I still mean it right. <laughs> and uh, the, the Swarte Piet, the Black Piet, is portrayed as a black man. It's all white men walking there, but they put black paint on their faces and they're dressed exactly as how the Moors were, were portrayed. Um, uh, and, and then they walk around with, with this sack and, and with uh, uh, something to hit children with, like a sort of stick to hit children with who have been bad throughout the year. And this white uh, uh, Santa is sitting on his horse. White horse. And on his white horse, dressed as the Pope, you, you righteously said so. And then um, the Black Peeps, they have to do all the dirty work and they act like clowns. And they make them speak Dutch on the television, for example, with a sort of Surinamese type of accent uh -huh. and pronouncing the words completely uh, wrong, like uh, they're speaking a sort of pigeon Dutch. Uh, and uh, um, it's it's horrible. It's, uh, it's really horrible. And children can put their shoes uh, under the chimney at night in the period uh, before this feast. And they say that then the Black Feet, Santa Claus and his Black Feet, they are uh, uh, walking on the roofs of the houses, and then the black feet, he comes through the chimney and he, he, he then puts a uh, presents. The, the children have to put like a carrot in their shoes and then he takes away the carrot because that's for the horse of Santa Claus. And then he puts a little present in their shoes. So I think that's very important because what do they say when, when we oppose against the caricature of Swarte Piet? They say the Swarte Piet is black because he comes through the chimney. <laughs> so they turn it around so that, oh, all of a sudden he's black because he comes through the chimney. And what sort of big hoopty do you are making of this? Because uh, that's why he's black. But uh, it's not true because if you listen to the song, you know why he's black. And then, of course, there's history itself. I mean, at one juncture, Holland was uh, dominated by Spain. Absolutely. And, and then Spain, of course, uh, was uh, dominated by, by the, the Moors. Moors, the Africans. So uh, there is the history that they're trying to cover up. I mean, I'm, I'm telling people, listen, the only way we can change this is if we all keep our children, because in the schools, this feast is part of the school curriculum. So the children, whether they like it or not, they have to be part of this feast. So what I'm trying to ask parents to do is to let their children stay home on that day. So they don't have to be subjected to this type of uh, discrimination, racism sort of element in the Dutch society. Hmm. Tell us about the feast. Of what, how, what does this feast consist of? Well, what happens is that um, um, in somewhere in November, like the middle of November, uh, Santa Claus comes from Spain, they say, with his black peat. <laughs> and in Spain, he has been monitoring how well the children have behaved themselves during the last year. And the children who have behaved themselves well, properly, will get presents, and the children who have behaved badly will be put in the sack, and they will be taken back to Spain with Sinterklaas. This is all fake, but this is the story. Mm. Now, what happens is that uh, the, all the shops, 
are decorated with this white Santa and his black peat. They are walking around throughout the city and um, people are buying presents. And um, then they write poems for each other, like, uh, well, you know, poems in which they describe how people have behaved during the year. And then they exchange gifts. So they, it's like a lottery. And then uh, you, you draw a, a, a name of somebody and then, you know, like people yes. do at Christmas time. Yes. And then you buy the person uh, who you draw, you, you buy the person a present and write a little poem for that person. Well, what happens is that um, on the 4th of December, because it's Santa Claus' birthday on the 5th, Mm. And that's when he gives all the presents. He gives them on the fort already. They call it Pakjes Avond, which means a packet evening. Mm. And then there will be a knock on the door, and there will be a Swarte Piet standing in front of the house with a whole bag full of presents for the children who live in that house. And, uh, I mean, at a certain age, children do realize that the presents come from their parents and not from this Sinterklaas. But I know children who are very afraid of this Swarte Piet element because they're afraid that they will be put in the sack and taken back to Spain. And uh, it's th- that this, this is the, you know, the tenure of the feast. I've, I've, uh, I've read and, and heard that uh, certainly... Uh, a few years ago, uh, little Dutch children would run screaming when they would see an African because of this water peat uh, connection. Oh, I tell you, I tell you, I'm, 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 I feel very strongly about this because <clears throat> I was six years old when I came to live in the Netherlands, and we were one of the three black families in a whole area in a city because in in the 1960s there weren't that many black people living here as they're living now. So from the minute Sinterklaas entered uh, the city, he came, he comes with a ship. Um, we were, m- me and my brother and my uh, sisters were called Swarte Piet. Mm. And people were afraid of black, uh, children mm. were indeed afraid of black people because in all black people, mm. they would see Swarte Piet. Mm. I mean, nowadays it's it's sort of different, uh, but uh, still children are being pestered. You know, children can be very rude towards each other, and they can uh, they 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 are pestered uh, during this time because if you're black, you are for for these two months you're swapped the beat. Hmm. You know, we we experienced the, the, so much of the same thing here. Um, in 1966, I. Uh, ended up with a five-year prison term because at the city hall uh, in, in the city of St. Petersburg, Florida, where I, where I, I grew up, uh, had an eight-by-four-foot picture that caricaturized African people uh, with huge uh, pink lips that covered most of, most of the face and uh, uh, with arms that extended beyond their knees and what have you. And I ended up tearing that, that eight uh by four foot mural down from the wall of City Hall, and uh, I, I was sentenced to five years in prison. And just a, and just a couple of months ago, um, in October, in fact, uh, uh, some white woman had in her yard a a um, caricature of an African, an effigy of an African being lynched, hanging from uh, from a noose on a in a very well made scaffold in her yard. And wow. uh, um, uh, I tore it down. I went into her yard and I tore it down. And it was a life-size effigy. And I was condemned for that. And, and people on the city council here was wondering why they didn't put me in prison and, and uh, what have you. And, of course, they would have put me in prison uh, were it not for the fact that we have a pretty serious uh, political base that um, would, have made it, would have complicated it for them. But the reality is that they always say, well, it didn't mean anything. You know, they, ne- they yeah. never meant anything by it. I mean, I, 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 w- I went to do some shopping yesterday and I bumped into two of these stupid uh, white people who are uh, covered up as, as if they're the black peeps. Yeah. And I yeah. thought, you yeah. know, I'm going to pass by them. But if one of them dared to come to me, 
I'm gonna hit them. <laughs> I, I'm I'm gonna hit them so hard they 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 will probably go home and take off that black paint off their face and never walk around like that no more. It's uh it's so humiliating. It is. That was Peggy Burke speaking from Amsterdam, where she was organizing to put an end to the Dutch tradition of Christmas parades, featuring Swarte Piet talking with African People's Socialist Party Chairman Omali Eshetela. You are listening to Black Power Talks, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today we are learning about the colonial origins of Santa Claus, also known as Santa Claus, or St. Nick, the patron saint of shipping. A study by Northwestern University has found that for every dollar a white family has, a black family has one cent. The colonial media has marketed the holiday season as the most wonderful time of the year. Yet, for the African poor and working class, the holiday season is marked by increased anxiety and depression. This colonial violence inevitably leads to increased incidents of horizontal violence in the African community during the holiday period. All around the world, African activists attempt to mitigate the dehumanizing effects of the holiday season on African families with their own gift giveaways and other African-centered holiday celebrations. Other organizers have responded with direct action. During the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, groups like the Congress of Racial Equality led popular boycotts and pickets of department stores for their demeaning treatment of African shoppers. Since the Yahuwah movement brought the term to the masses in the 1970s, a lot of activists like to speak of building dual power. These efforts to create parallel institutions could be seen as forms of dual power, but this is why the Yahuwah movement says that power must not only be dual power, but dual and contending power. Regardless of how militant, action that does not contend with colonial power in fact allows colonial capitalism to reform itself. We see that as the police departments come into African communities that they occupy and hold their own holiday giveaways and white-owned shopping malls now employ black sanders. Next, we want to share an excerpt from a presentation given by Chairman O'Malley two weeks later on December 19, 2004 to the regular Sunday community meeting at the Uhuru House in St. Petersburg, Florida, the same building that today houses our radio station, Black Power 96.3 FM. In this talk, Chairman O'Malley goes deeper into the colonial origins of Santa Claus and also discusses the social and political context of the famous Charles Dickens novel titled A Christmas Carol. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about Santa Claus. How many people know of Santa Claus in here? Well, Santa Claus, uh, uh, there's a history to Santa Claus. Um, and uh, we want to say some things about that history. But I told you I was in, in Holland. And one of the places I was in Holland was in Amsterdam. I was in Amsterdam, I think, on November 4th. And in Holland... Uh, they have this thing about Santa Claus. The name of the Santa Claus that you, uh, this little cherubic, uh, chubby, little unhealthy uh, white guy, that uh, you, well now he's, he's even become brown and black and stuff like that, that you take your children to visit. This Santa Claus uh, has its origin, its immediate origin, in Santa Claus. Santa Claus is, is the Dutch name. And it was the patron saint of shipping. There's a Catholic in the room know what I'm talking about when I say a patron saint of shipping, Santa Claus. And uh, according to the Dutch, Santa Claus is this, this wonderful guy who comes along and with Santa, traveling with Santa Claus is an African whose name is Sparta Pete, Black Pete. And Santa Claus travels throughout uh, the Netherlands, throughout Holland, and Pete is the helper. He works for Santa Claus. And he gives away gifts to the good children, and to the bad children, he puts them in a sack and takes them to Spain. So uh, when I was in Holland, the Santa Claus parade 
was happening. And uh, I didn't know it was happening. When we first got there, we were walking through a mall, and I saw a little white child in an uh, outfit that, uh, uh, with a little cape on and with something like soot on her face. And I thought, I'm saying, okay, this is November. Maybe in, in November they do something like Halloween in Holland. Because I wasn't thinking about the, the Santa Claus and the Black Pete thing until we began walking from the train station to the place that we were going to be staying. And the person who was walking with us, who himself was a politician, he says, the Santa Claus parade is going to be happening right here. You want to see it? And say, yeah, let's see the parade. <laughs> and so here we are standing watching this parade, this incredible thing. That was mind-boggling. They had a thing, a parade, and all, first of all, I saw all these, these white people uh, with, with soot, like not soot, like shoe polish, black face, like minstrels, like minstrels, right? And uh, 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 all over their faces. And so I, I, I couldn't believe it. I'm taking pictures, and they, they, they saw nothing wrong with it. They just posed for me, you know? They didn't do like this or anything, but you know. <laughs> That would have been going too far. <laughs> but they did wear fake dreadlocks and fake afros. And they did imitations of what they, what, what they think you dance like. And, and what happened was uh, the, the, the mayor of uh, central Amsterdam happened to be walking through. And somebody said, that's the mayor. So the mayor and I got involved in this sort of spontaneous uh, debate on the streets. There is a video of that also, of me and the mayor debating this whole issue. And the mayor assured me, I just didn't understand. <laughs> didn't understand. Because, you know, uh, outsiders just don't understand. You understand? Of course, I'm, I'm not an It's a black thing. <laughs> but I'm not an outsider. Uh, uh, so I want to show you, this is uh, some, some stuff from the parade. I want to show you this before we talk more about the whole uh, basis of, of, uh, of the modern Christmas and Santa Claus. There's Santa Claus on his white horse with his Pope hat and his cross. Yeah, white people in blackface. Schwarte Pete. Those are his helpers. Yeah, might be. There you are. So that's in, in quite civilized Holland. And uh, all look was like Holland, because in Holland, you can go there and in the cafes, you can smoke hashish. And you can go to the red light district, uh, where there are near nude women who are advertising themselves for sale. Um, behind glass windows. I was talking to Penny yesterday and she was telling me she watched this movie Collateral. And in the Collateral, uh, uh, there was, uh, I guess, this Mexican who was referring to a kind of Christmas thing and he spoke of uh, Pedro Negro, Black Pete. And I tell you, it's interesting because Black Pete takes children, he sticks them in sacks and he takes them to Spain. Do you, do, you, do you know why he would take them to Spain? Anybody? The Moors. Because Spain was occupied uh, by the Moors, Africans, right? Uh, So-called Moors. And um, so yeah, I think you got a whole bunch of stuff mixed up in there because Black Pete also gives away spices to the good people, which is what they tell us that the, the colonialists were looking for when they crossed the ocean. Isn't that right? It's just interesting, and, and Spain also, at one juncture, dominated Holland. Did you know that? Yeah, and so uh, that's part of the connection. Spain would be the connection to Mexico, where you would find the Pedro Negro. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that. But I wanted to say some more things about that, because there is a, a, a basis uh, for this whole Santa Claus, and we live in, in societies and countries with traditions, and institutions that we don't understand. In fact, people get born into situations 
which give the impression of having always been like that. But you can understand the ideas and institutions in a society based on the kind of society it is, the kind of social system it is, the kind of relations of production. When I mean relations of production, I mean the kinds of relationships that exist in society for the purpose of that society acquiring what it needs uh, in the form of food, clothing, and shelter for its development. And the ideas in any society springs from that reality. There are people who actually believe that it's ideas that create reality, but in, in the real world, it is this reality that gives rise to certain ideas. And there is a juncture in, in time where we come to certain kinds of conclusions and ideas can be important to change in this reality, but the, the origin of these ideas is the social reality itself. All ideas, there's no ideas born outside the context of that social reality. And as, as, as we live in societies which are dominated by class, cla ideas uh, have class characters and class content. And in any society, it is the ruling class, the class that has the political and economic power is also the class that has the intellectual power. And, and uh, from whence all the ideas or most of the ideas in that society spring. All right? So during, uh, when you look at the Christmas as, as it is practiced in general, uh, and, uh, throughout the United States and, and throughout Europe and those places which are influenced by Europe. For example, a couple of years ago in December, I found myself in what they call South Africa. And was, it was shocking all over the place to see uh, Christmas trees and Christmas like similar to what you would find here. But there's something else about South Africa too, isn't there? That the, the ones who constructed the ideological a system of oppression in South Africa were who? The Dutch, uh, from the same place that we're talking about in the Netherlands. Uh, and when I say the ideological thing, I'm talking about the whole apartheid, segregation, etc. Now, the whole capitalist system that everyone, uh, most uh, thinking people in this country hold up and say it's wonderful and, and is prepared to kill, to defend, and extend around the world. This whole system that has brought wealth uh, uh, to the white world in general has its origin in the first place in slavery and has its origin in, in slavery and brigandage. That is to say the theft of resources uh, from other peoples around the world. Karl Marx, who at one juncture was held in high esteem, uh, by certain uh, people who call themselves revolutionaries, particularly throughout Europe and North America, uh, refer to this phenomenon as, as primitive accumulation of capital. In, in order to understand how capitalism, how capitalist production got started, he said that, he said that uh, in order for there to be capitalist production, there must be capitalist accumulation. But in order for there to be capitalist accumulation, there must also be capitalist production. So we can only get out of this situation, this, this weird situation, by, pre, by assuming that there must have been an accumulation of capital that predated, that came before the pro pro capitalist production. And this accumulation of capital he referred to as primitive accumulation. And he talked about this, this being born out of turning Africa into a warren for the hunting of black skins. Uh, he referred to uh, the internment of the uh, Indians uh, in North America and, and, and throughout the Americas, the so-called New World, uh, into the mines where bringing up silver and gold that went to Europe. Of course, there was the British attack in 1841 and 42 on China uh, that turned China into a nation of junkies. Forced, they call it the Opium War, forced China uh, to become a nation of junkies, the situation where France held Vietnam for 100 years and got most of the colonial resources from Vietnam in the form of drug resources. This, be this is the origin of the startup, the startup money that the capitalist, the whole capitalist system was born of. It was slavery, and the key component was slavery. Not just, not just, not just the, the, the tremendous amount of resources that you get when you can work somebody for free, you can just work them for free. That's one aspect of it. But the key thing was what they call the slave trade. That is to say, the trade in, uh, in Africans throughout the world that created colonies throughout the world. Most of what we know in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the so-called countries, came about as a consequence of the slave trade. 
When you look at Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, when you look at Argentina and all those places, they came, the colonies were organized around the slave trade. And it's the slave trade that created for the first time in history a world economy that was a precondition for the rise of capitalism. And so it was the fact that Africans were being traded in as slaves all around the world that created for the first time a single economy that dominated the whole world and out of this the whole capitalist system was born. But can a society say that the reason we have all this wealth and uh, as white people and Indians are damn near decimated, Africans don't have nothing and everybody else is starving it's because we stole everything they got. They cannot, the society cannot condemn itself. It will never say because we stole it. And, and you have all these defenders of imperialism, capitalism, who refuse, even as they know the reality. They know I didn't pop up here in America under a collard green leaf. Some, there was a process that brought me here. And they know that it was slavery, but even that. They know that this land is the land of the indigenous people. They know that the Indians were killed. And, and murdered and massacred and the land stolen, but they will deny a relationship between this and their wealth and my poverty. They will deny that relationship. But, but that is real. So they cannot say that the reason you were poor because we stole everything we got. We worked you like dogs. We worked your family like beasts. And because you had to do all the work, it meant that my children could go to school and, and become this and that and become inventors and they can steal your inventions as well. Uh, uh, because you had to do all of that, we were free to build universities and do all these other things. Because of what you did, we took the resources that we made from you and we put them into factories and we put them into schools. And this value that we stole from you now, then is now concentrated uh, in IBM and Dell and, and all of these other resources. They don't, they can't say that to you. So what they do instead is they come up with various uh, explanations, philosophical explanations, which become the underpinning of a society. And some of them are very serious. You know, heavyweight philosophers, Kant, and, uh, and, and other forces like that, and they teach it in universities, but some are more subtle than that. And Santa Claus is one of them. What is Santa Claus? He is the jolly, cherubic, white guy who lives in the North Pole, where it's too cold to work, who has no black people, no Africans, no Indians, no Mexicans, no Asians, or anything like that with him, but has these little dwarfs, these shorties, uh, and all of whom are white, right? Who produce all of these resources, and he has these flying reindeers and what have you. And they just take off and they fly all over the world. And everybody who is good, they give something. And if you ain't got nothing, it's because you weren't good. So when you hear George Bush say that they hate us because we are good, you understand? He is, in his own way, uh, telling the story of Santa Claus. Uh, and what, he, what is offered by, by the Christmas story is an explanation for why all the wealth and value is in the white world that they didn't work for, that they didn't work for, nobody worked for it. It wasn't because there were people working on plantations in Brazil or in Congo where they cut off the hands of people who refused to take, to bring in the rubber for them. It didn't come from that. It was some magic shorties. <laughs> and this cherubic white guy who with the reindeers, one of whom now has, since Gene Archer, has been introduced with a red nose, right? And they fly around and give all this stuff, and that's where it came from, because we are good. And this is the explanation. This is the explanation. Let me tell you that uh, in, the, in the 19th century, there was a movement throughout Europe, a very serious movement, because I told you uh, just in passing, like what happened in Congo, at least 10 million Africans were killed in Congo. Congo was colonized by Belgium. Congo is 80 times larger than Belgium. 
And Congo is the size of India. In India, there are a billion people, but thanks to slavery and colonialism, there are only 50 million people, if that, left in Congo today, maybe less than that, because in the last five years or so, about five million Africans have been killed in Congo. This is the, this is the devastating impact that colonialism has had on us. And in Congo, of course, uh, they would do things like try to force the Africans to work in rubber plantations. They had just discovered the significance of rubber, needed them for automobile tires and things like that. And so uh, they would force the Africans to work in the rubber plantations. And the Africans didn't want to work, so they would do things like kidnap their wives uh, to make them go out and work. And then they would do other things like cut off the hands. Do you hear what I'm saying? They would literally cut off the hands of Africa. And there are pictures showing mountains, mountains of hands that were cut off from African people to force the villagers to go and work on the rubber plantations. Now the rubber plantations made Firestone and other major corporations around the world rich. But it devastated Congo. And this is the dialectic that we are talking about. Now, you have a situation where the first 20 Africans brought to America as captives, 1619, was that it? Yes. Were brought by the Dutch. And if they were brought by the Dutch, there is a great likelihood, and they were on the good ship Jesus, by the way. And if they were brought by the Dutch, there is a great likelihood that that ship was blessed by the patron saint, Santa Claus. So in other words, Africans in this country were a gift to the white folks from Santa Claus. That is the kind of reality that we are dealing with and how also ideas play such a, a role in even trapping people in their slavery. Ideas play a profound role and so you have these ideas born out of the kind of social system and they are there to reinforce uh, the enslavement of a people. It reinforces, it convinces the, the, the white people that the reason they have everything and every white person you know even your liberals who work at your popular community radio stations and listen to it all the time will defend to the death the relationships that exist in this country and will tell you that they didn't do it to you because you're black, they did it because you're a worker. What's the difference in that? That's redundant. <laughs> they will argue with you around this question. Because it is a means by which they defend this relationship that they have. So that was in Holland. But in Holland, the power of the ideas is that there were Africans who were there with that brought their children to see this thing. Anyway, if we have anything with, to do with it, it's not going to last much longer. Because I was just in Paris at a meeting of the European uh, region of these Africans who say they want to do some struggle. And we told them that we think one of the most important struggles we can engage in is to have, make an international call to Africans from around the world to come to Amsterdam next year <laughs> and kick Santa Claus off that horse <laughs> and introduce Holland to the real Black Pete <laughs> and let him know that we mad as hell and we want everything that he took from us back. But anyway, I wanted to say that capitalism was born of a grotesquely bestial, profoundly oppressive theft and, op and, and of, of all of our resources and terrible things done to the peoples around the world. But in the 19th century, there was born a movement in Europe because out of the things that they stole from us, you saw emerging in Europe what they call the Industrial Revolution. And, and white people, for the first time, 
were freed from, uh, uh, from serfdom uh, and from the being stuck on the land in a feudal situation, and then now we're going into the factories. In fact, the ruling class began to kick them off the land and force them into a situation where they would have to work in the capitalist system in order to exist. They called it the Land Enclosure Acts and things like that. And so you had these white folk working in the factories, sometimes children who were being maimed in the factories, women, no rules, anything like that, working under terrible conditions. And so you had a movement among intellectuals in Europe in opposition to this capitalism as it was expressing itself there, not to what it was doing to us in the Congo, not to what it was doing to the people in China or any place else, but how it was affecting white children and white uh, women and, and workers there. So they, they, they came to the conclusion that they had to convince the ruling class to moderate this capitalism, make capitalism kind and gentle. And one of the intellectuals involved in this movement not, uh, uh, was a man named Charles Dickens. You familiar with Dickens? Yeah. Dickens is the guy who wrote uh, the book upon which this thing that you're going to see over and over again during this period of time on television called Christmas Carols. Christmas Carol is the story of the prototypical capitalist who is a man called Scrooge. No, Scrooge doesn't like Christmas. People come to Scrooge and, he, and, 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 and say, Merry Christmas, he's the bar humbug. He's a relatively ruthless capitalist. He works his own nephew, isn't his nephew, uh, who is his nephew, Bob Cratchit? Uh, 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 and there's a crippled guy, Tiny Tim, I think, who's, uh, who might also be a relative. And, and Scrooge is just horrible to everybody. And, the, and these, these intellectuals are trying to get the capitalists to treat uh, the workers better. And so they use Scrooge, and then they have, they have Scrooge goes to sleep. He, he must, have, must have eaten something terrible because uh, he goes to sleep, and he wakes up with these, uh, uh, he gets these visits from these ghosts, right? And there's Christmas past and Christmas present, Christmas future. And as a consequence of this, Scrooge, the capitalist, is a changed person. He likes Tiny Tim. Bob Cratchit gets the day off. I think Scrooge actually goes home with him to eat. But the thing is that it was, it was this part of this struggle to get them to moderate capitalism that Christmas now becomes this thing where you give, uh, where you are nice to people, etc. cetera. And, and, and Dickens wasn't the only one, but he was a part of a general movement to win the capitalists to be nice to people. And so that's the basis, that's the origin of things like Christmas Carol and what you're going to be watching on TV maybe tonight when you leave here. Uh, and if you don't see it tonight, you're damn sure you're going to see it uh, between now and December 26th. And you can't help it. There's, there's no way you're going to be able to avoid it, but that's the origin of it, and you need to know it. And what has to happen is that people who are oppressed have to construct philosophical systems in opposition to the social system that keeps them oppressed. And that's why we say, uh, you bring us Santa Claus and we come in to kick his butt. And that's a part of a, we have another philosophy in contention with the philosophy that you just put forward. Right. And ours represent when, when, when Santa Claus show up, we want everything in the bag because it belongs to us, you understand? <laughs> and, and, and we want to go to the secret location where he got all the shorties that's supposed to be producing it because it belongs to us, you understand? And that's that we have to create our own contending philosophy that is opposed to slavery, that is opposed to colonialism, that is opposed to oppression, and that stands for the emancipation of African people and human beings on this planet and the eradication of a system of workers and bosses and slaves and slave masters. Uhuru. <laughs> That was Chairman Amali Shatella speaking on December 19th, 2004 at a Sunday community meeting at the Uhuru House in St. Petersburg, Florida. The same building that today houses our community radio station, Black Power 96.3 FM. You have been listening to Black Power Talks. Today, we learned about the colonial origins of Santa Claus, also known as Santa Claus or St. Nick, the patron saint of shipping. Our theme song, Get Up and Do Something was written and performed by Alika and Goma. Thanks to the Black Power Talks production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, 
Empress Live Wire and the Hipster Panda. You can pray until you faint, but if you don't get up and try to do something, God is not going to put it in your lap. And it's no need of running and no need of saying, honey, I'm not going to get in the mess. Thank you.